Hey, hey, future respiratory therapists, I have a wonderful case study here provided to me by ALMNS97, and we're going to break this down. Now, what, what's been asked is, is uh, break this down, talk about mixed acidosis, and just help understand from a respiratory therapist standpoint, what should I be seeing and what should I be thinking in this scenario, okay? So I'm going to do that now, uh, break it down for you. I've got uh, the basis information that was provided to me from the initial message and so um, I'm going to break that down for you and we'll just kind of work through it. So we're going to work from this side of the board through to this side of the board, okay? This was the blood gas initially and here's what I love the most about this. The person that sent me this said I just happened to be walking through ICU and I saw this scenario going on and I jumped in it and kind of tried to learn from it, okay? And that is exactly what every respiratory therapy student and new grad, I mean, hell, even experienced therapists should be doing when you have time instead of going to the break room and sitting down and gossiping about stupid policies or procedures or Gray's Anatomy or whatever else you're talking about get up and go walk through the critical care areas of your hospital and see what you can learn especially for the new grads and the students do not ever take a break to where you just step out that's called clocking out, okay? After you clock out, then go home and enjoy your time with the family. But when you're on the job and you're trying to learn as much as you can and you want to be the best respiratory therapist you can, the way you do that is infusing yourself into these type of scenarios that just happen to pop up. And then six months, eight months, a year down the road, when you're that ICU respiratory therapist for that shift, then you've seen something similar to this. And you've already already been exposed to it and you've already critically thought about this and you're going to be steps ahead of somebody who says and eh, I'll just learn it as it comes up because sometimes it takes a long time for these situations to come up and your input can help manage this stuff so here we go enough about that let's break it down here's here was our initial blood gas pH 7.12 CO2 is 27 O2 is 116 bicarb is 10 Okay, now what we know here is that we have a partially compensated metabolic acidosis. Okay, so we know it's a metabolic acidosis because we have an acidotic pH and a low bicarb. Our CO2 is down, which means that this patient is attempting to compensate for the metabolic acidosis. The body does this through Kushmal's respirations. Okay, so fast, deep breaths, trying to get rid of as much CO2 as possible to hopefully help bring the pH back up into normal range. Now, it's not in normal range, so it's not compensated, definitely not fully compensated. It is compensating or partially compensated, depending on the verbiage that you use uh, in your, your area. Okay, so the Kushmal's respirations also tells us and explains the CO2 being 116. Okay? If minute ventilation goes up, you have more oxygen coming, more air, more, more gas coming in. O2 goes up, CO2 goes down, trying to compensate for the metabolic acidosis. Clear. Okay, now what causes the metabolic acidosis? Two things. Either a gain in non-volatile acids or a loss in bicarb. Okay? So things that'll cause an increase in your non-volatile acids are things like lactic acidosis. Diabetic ketoacidosis, to name two of the big ones, okay? Other things as well, but just for time's sakes, think those two things, right? Those are big, common, common uh, increases in non-volatile acids. Now, giving bicarb to those patients will not help. It will not fix the metabolic disturbance. It may make your blood gas look a little better, but it's not going to fix the problem. Okay. Now, the other thing that could cause a metabolic acidosis such as this is a loss of bicarb. So, in cases such as severe diarrhea, okay, where you have patient comes in weeks and weeks of severe diarrhea, they have a metabolic acidosis. That's because their body has actually physically lost their base. Okay, those patients need their base supplier, their bicarb resupplied and so bicarb will help those patients okay now how do you know which is which you have to calculate the anion gap and in this case the anion gap is 35 why is that important because normal depending on which references you use 8 to 14 some places say 8 to 15 either way 
35 is extremely high for your anion gap, which tells you you have an increase in non-volatile acids. Okay, so we're looking at either lactic acidosis, uh, diabetic ketoacidosis. You said the, 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 the person who sent this to me mentioned that they were going on dialysis. So this may be severe chronic kidney disease or end-stage renal disease. Uh, that will also cause an increase in your anion gap because the kidneys now fail to remove acids. And so you get an increase in your anion gap. Okay, that's important because that tells us we got to figure out what the problem is and treat the problem. Okay, now at the time this gas was taken, the patient was on pressure control at a PIP of 22 with a rate of 28 to 30. Now, the rate of 28 to 30 meaning tells me that the patient is breathing over the ventilator. If, if it was set, there would just be one number, right? But 28 to 30 tells me that the respiratory rate is varying, which means the patient is triggering these pressure control breaths above what is the set rate. And that makes sense because we see a low CO2 right here. Okay? When you put a patient on a ventilator and metabolic acidosis is present, you need to be very aware that, that you don't correct their CO2 because you're going to undo the attempt to compensate. Okay, so you want to keep their minute ventilation very high until you fix the metabolic disturbance and you see your pH trending upwards. As it nears normal, then you can start turning down your minute ventilation to allow CO2 to come back into a normal range. But when it's compensating, you need to keep that compensatory mechanism there. So do not normalize this person's CO2 yet. Okay, now two hours later, there was a blood gas drawn. And the blood gas gave us 6.98, CO2 of 58, O2 of 26, bicarb 11.4, our anion gap is now 39. Now, this looks weird, right? You go, wait a second, what's going on here? Well, it's important to note that this is a venous blood gas. So this brings us to what do we know about venous blood gas versus arterial blood gas? Now, we know that typically the pH correlates very, very well venous to arterial. So it's going to be slightly more acidotic because the, the tissues bring in oxygen and put off CO2. So your CO2 concentration in venous blood is slightly higher than arterial, which means your pH is going to be slightly more acidotic. Okay, So we know that pH correlates very, very well, slightly more acidotic than arterial, arterial pH. We also know that typically... CO2 closely correlates with arterial CO2. So typically when you get a blood gas back and you see a CO2 of 58, then you can assume or you can assess and say, okay, well, my, my arterial CO2 is roughly probably a little less than that. So if I get 58 here, then I'm guessing probably 50 to 53, 52, somewhere around there. Okay. Now O2, no correlation. No correlation between venous blood gas and arterial blood gas when it comes to oxygenation. Do not use a venous blood gas to assess your patient's oxygenation status. If they do not correlate, they're nowhere close, such as this. Look at this, right? Very, very different. And then uh, venous bicarb closely correlates also with arterial. So we can use a venous blood gas. It's not that... So the statement was like, well, you can't use this because it's inaccurate, okay? Well, it's not that it's inaccurate, okay? It's just that you have to understand the relationships between them. Knowing that the O2 is, is not an indicator of oxygenation, pH is an indicator of, rough indicator of pH of that patient, okay? Not exact, but close, CO2 is usually relatively close. There's an asterisk here that I need to put because it's not, I, it doesn't match up directly. And there's one, there's an outlying way, there's an outlying scenario where this gap becomes even larger. Okay. And the bicarb is good. So you can look at this blood gas and go, okay, I'm not going to look at the O2 because it's venous, but I can look at the rest of it and see that we're still in we still have this anion gap increase. Our bicarb is still roughly the same. So what's going on with this CO2? It looks high. Well, let's ask a question, okay? Has our minute ventilation changed? 
Because if it has, then let's say they were breathing over the vent here, 28 to 30. But let's say we gave them, gave them, uh, put them on a paralyzing agent or maybe uh, put them on a sedative and we knocked out their drive to breathe and now they're no longer breathing over the vent. If you have a set rate of 14, then obviously your minute ventilation has now declined and your CO2 is now up from where it was. Okay, so you can use it like that. Now, the outline scenario, what the research shows is that in times such as shock, okay, this gap between CO2, the correlation between CO2 from a venous blood gas to an arterial blood gas becomes greater and less reliable. And that's what I'm going to guess is going on here without any further information. And here's why. I don't think our CO2 is 51 or 52. And the reason I don't is because if our, our, if our venous blood gas, if our venous CO2 is 58, and I just told you they, cl they closely correlate, except for in times such as shock, and then that correlation kind of widens and it gets less reliable as an indicator, then you have to say, okay, if my CO2 here was say 53, then my pH would be way south of 6.98. Because look, this is essentially the same. And this is essentially the same. That's the problem causer here. If our actual arterial CO2 was 53 up from 27, you would get a significant drop in your pH. Like you're, if, if this was an arterial blood gas, if you could have obtained an arterial blood gas, the pH is still probably damn near about the same. Because remember, venous blood gas, very close correlation, is slightly more acidotic than arterial. Well, look, this is slightly more acidotic than 7.12. 100%. Slightly more acidotic, right? Which tells us that this is probably not a good indicator in this case of arterial CO2 because of, I'm assuming probably the shock. We're talking about no radio pulses were, were, were able to be palpated. We're going on dialysis. I'm imagining the patient was hypotensive if I had to guess. Okay, there, This patient is probably in shock and this no longer becomes a valid indicator. Now, if this is a COPD or on admission, okay, which actually don't even use that scenario because your bicarb wouldn't be 11. But let's say you had a bicarb of, of 30 and a CO2 of, of 70 and a pH of, of 7. Now you can use that venous blood gas as an indicator of CO2. And what do you need to do in this case? You need to increase minute ventilation to get your CO2 down. In this case, to truly understand what's going on and to truly make a follow-up assessment to this arterial blood gas, we would truly need another arterial blood gas because of what sounds like a shock presentation, this becomes unreliable. Other than that, it's typically a good indicator and correlates very, very closely. So without more information, I can't really break it down any further than that. Okay, the takeaway from this video is understanding when you look at a venous blood gas, what typically correlates closely and what doesn't. O2 doesn't. Everything else typically correlates pretty close with the pH being slightly more acidotic and the CO2 being slightly higher than arterial concentration of carbon dioxide. Okay. Hey, I hope this helps. I, I, I know I didn't give you an answer. But I hope I drove some points home that you can look at and go, okay, I can, I can sift through this and, and make a little bit more sense of it. All of this comes down to practice, 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 practice. Keep practicing. Keep, keep submerging yourself in learning situations such as this. And your pathway to being a great respiratory therapist is just around the corner. Because you're, you're, you're challenging yourself. Don't walk by, by this room and go, it's not my patient, I don't care. You missed out on a learning opportunity if you did that. But if you step in that room, talk to the respiratory therapist who's dealing with the patient, ask questions, and learn, then you're in a phenomenal state and you're going to go uh, forward 
being able to critically think, having seen all of these scenarios before. Okay, best wishes, guys.